Hello! Welcome to the Now Man Show. My name is Nicewander. Joining us today is Robert Margaliff. He's the Grammy Award winning electronic music pioneer who's been affectionately called the godfather of electronica. He's an innovative record producer and engineer, audio expert, and film producer. He helped to bring the Moog synthesizer into modern music with Stevie Wonder in the 70s on albums such as Talking Book and his Grammy award-winning album, Inner Visions. And in 1980, he produced the classic song, Whip It, by the band Devo. Along with his collaborator, Malcolm Cecil, in 1971, he released the album, Zero Time, as an electronic duo calling themselves Tano's expanding headband, which attracted Stevie Wonder and other leading artists to this emerging electronic music technology. He's worked with Stevie Wonder, Billy Preston, Depeche Mode, Oingo Boingo, Quincy Jones, Jeff Beck, the Isley Brothers, the Doobie Brothers, Joan Baez, Guar, and many more. He's co-produced Chow, Manhattan, a film about 1960s counterculture and collaborated with synthesizer pioneer Robert Moog. He's been a partner of Safe Harbor Pictures and a principal founder of Mikasa Multimedia, specializing in studio mixing of surround sound. He will be featured in the upcoming PBS special, Sound Breaking, a series created by the late, great Sir George Martin. His current multimedia project with breakthrough artist Lexi Baker will be the first recording ever to be released in HBS 12.1 headphone surround sound technology. Robert Margaleff, welcome to The Now Man Show. Thank you very much for having me. It's my great pleasure. Excellent. Uh, we're going to have some fun. Okay. So um, let's first start with where it all began. Are, are you from uh, New York? I am from New York City, and uh, I uh, had like a long history there. I found myself uh, in the early days, in the uh, late 60s, uh, living, found myself living across the street from uh, the Fillmore East. Oh, you did? Wow. And I attended the first concert. It was Jefferson Airplane. Oh, excellent. And I had a walk-up tenement apartment around the corner on Fifth Street. And uh, one thing led to another, and I became very immersed in the off-off Broadway scene, and then uh, the scene that was slowly developing uh, at Max's Kansas City, and a bunch of expats from uh, Andy Warhol's factory. Wow. And we all kind of circulated and partied at Max's at night, compared yeah. notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up uh, my parents said, oh, my son, the filmmaker, the great, he's going to be a great film mogul. In the yeah. meantime, I was, you know, making underground movies and uh, living the life at night, at the, you know, at all the local night watering holes and partying and stuff. But uh, I ended up making a film called Chow Manhattan with Edie Sedgwick, Jane Holzer, Allen Ginsberg, Paul America, Viva who were all expatriates of the factory, Andy's factory. Now, the Andy Warhol's factory was a very unique group of what artists and musicians and all. And right. Yes, indeed. It was a sort of a, um, Andy would kind of watch, and, yeah. and everyone would do stuff inside of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they'd make all different kinds of movies. They were all different kinds. Paul America was another person, uh, Charles Wine. David Weissman, a whole bunch of different people all became involved in various aspects of uh, Andy's filmmaking. In the process, uh, I wanted to make a feature film, and uh, one thing led to another, and I sort of became the alternative place to the factory, and ended up making Chow Manhattan. And were and you, now you were co-producer on that? I was so the producer and funder producer. of it, and I shot a good bit of it because I was trained courtesy of the U.S. government as a, in the Signal Corps when I was in the Army. Oh, really? Prior to that, I was trained as a combat photographer. Wow. There's uh, no aesthetics, but a lot of mechanical knowledge about this production camera and that production camera. So I've always made films in this kind of verite kind of way. Yeah, yeah. So one thing led to another. I ended up making a movie, and I was, uh, uh, was got to a place where I said, I wonder what I'm going to do for the soundtrack for this yeah. movie. So that's when you really got into music and sound? That yeah, that's point? when I really, I started as a student, music student, I mean, yeah. when I was, oh. in, you know, in junior high school. Did you play piano? I played piano, but I was also a major, majored at Manhattan School of Music and Voice. Oh. But I studied at Tanglewood in the summers with the Boston Symphony when I oh. was in high school, and 
music was always, I never thought I could make a living through music. I yeah. ended up, I want to be a filmmaker. Oh, wow. Well, filmmaking turned into, what am I going to do for a score for Chow Manhattan? Yes, yes. And so happens that a, uh, a friend of mine to this day, John Stork, who is uh, an architect, was the original designer of Electric Lady Studios. But he also designed a club called Cerebrum, which was very off the wall in the East Village. And it was there I heard my first synthesizer music in the club. Who was that? Uh, it was just bleeping and blooping up in the control room. It was just playing random noises. Oh. But I became so fascinated with it that in the long run, to make a long story short, uh, I ended up embracing the synthesizer and ditching the filmmaking. So, so just real quick, that, that synthesizer in the club, was that, was that a synthesizer? Actually, it, was actually, was randomly... it was actually a piece of a Moog synthesizer, of a Moog really? uh, modular. Yeah. But it was a, like the breadboard model. It was yeah. very early. I ended up making friends with Bob Moog. Ah. I went to the uh, very early AES show at Columbus Circle, and I came back with a uh, very nice Moog modular synthesizer which I used for my first band as well, because now I was busy making records. Instead of making movies, I was much more interested in making records because it was much more of immediate gratification. So you were one of uh, Robert Moog's very first customers then, and then you yes, guys became friends, and then yes. you collaborated? Well, or? he would come to the studio and try to stop the keyboards from drifting, and ah. we shared a lot of information. There were only a few people that had a synthesizer at that time. It was Peter Nero, Walter Sear, Wendy Carlos, Wendy Carlos. And, I, and myself. She's done a remarkable amount of work and um, really set the guideposts for us all. But what happened is that the synthesizer really became uh, what I call a major disruptor in music. <laughs> yes, and I was kind yes. of responsible for it because I started playing the synthesizer. I didn't want to make movies anymore. I didn't want to do any of that stuff anymore. Uh, I was getting immediate gratification by playing the synthesizer. Yes. There was no school. You couldn't go to school or read a book about this is how you use the Moog synthesizer. Exactly. So I really had to put my mind to learning how to use the synthesizer. In so doing, uh, I ended up uh, through a, a route of several years. Uh, I ended up stopped. I stopped making the movie, and uh, someone else took it over to finish it and shot it in color, which I didn't want to do. And oh, I moved wow. on. I moved on to. Um, making music on the synthesizer and really learning about how to use it. And one thing led to another, and I found myself at a place called Media Sound, and I was the synth guru yeah, yeah. at the studio. It was a com During the day, it was commercials. At night, it was closed because the union thing yeah, was yeah, heavy. Yeah, yeah. And that is where I met Malcolm Cecil. And, and so then you've created this electronic duo, which you call the, yourselves Tonto's... Tonto's Expanding Headband. <laughs> yes, okay. What does Tonto stand for? The Original Neo Tambral Orchestra. Oh, wow. The interesting thing about that synthesizer was, that, and to this day people don't use the synthesizer that way particularly, yeah, yeah. is normally one person plays one instrument at a time, and you get mm -hmm. two or three people in the room, they each have their own instrument, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, with the synthesizer, with the Moog that we had, Tonto, which was actually six synthesizers in a huge, turned into a huge and case. You, ha you had the patch board too, right? Yeah, the... we had to patch everything, yeah, it was all yeah, analog. Yeah, yeah. But the interesting thing was that it was many musicians playing one instrument, wow. where the programming was interactive. Right, right, wow. So. If, like, Stevie was playing a bass line, we would make the entire synthesizer transpose with that bass line so that I could then play string parts. And as long as I played everything on the white notes, I couldn't make a mistake. Yes, yeah, yeah. Because it would always be in the key of the bass line. Now, he heard your band, did he? Yes, we did. We put out an album. Herbie Mann heard us one night raving away in the studio at night because media at night was closed basically because yeah. the unions did, insisted on double time for the players. Yeah. And the commercial, people, you know, during the day I was doing things like Crazy Daisy toilet paper commercials. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, which did not, it was not really all that thrilling, you know. Guy sitting in the back of the room, he says, yeah, hey, kid, because I looked like something like a refugee from a U-boat from another planet, right? Now, had hair like this with a gold vest on yeah. and had a joint sticking out of my mouth. <laughs> and uh, he would say to me, hey, kid, could you make that thing sound a little bit more like that tablecloth? <laughs> you know, and I, 
I decided at that point that, you know, I, I really wanted to concentrate on really investigating electronic music synthesis. The synthesizer is not an instrument that imitates live instruments. Yeah, okay? yeah. A synthesizer takes the sound from the universe. Right, right, right. It's vibrating electrons. It's any sound that you want to make. It doesn't necessarily have to relate to a instrument from the past. That's right. What it was really was the first real major disruptor in yes. music and recording in the 70s. It really changed the face of pop music when we brought the synthesizer to, to bear in the pop music scene. Malcolm, myself, and Stevie were the first to sort of really genuinely explore it. Wendy Carlos was exploring classical music. Right, right. Other guys were doing, uh, you know, some uh, Tomita was there, Silver Apples uh, was Tangerine there. Tangerine Dream. Tangerine Dream. Jean-Michel Jarre. Yeah. yeah. All of those folks came on the scene, but they were all kind of, you know, trying to do space age right, stuff right. where our m music really sort of aimed itself directly at R&B. And that's where you started with working with, with Stevie Wonder. Correct. What happened was we did an album. Malcolm and I were in the studio late one night. We had this big, it was a former church. Media Sound was a oh, wow, former cool. church. Strangely enough, Bella Bartok lived in that building at one time. You mean time. Uh, Bella Lugosi? No, or Bella Bartok. Bella Bartok did. Yes. Oh, oh. In the 20s. Cool, yeah. But it was yeah. like a big church, and I had the synthesizer on a big sort of rolling gurney in the studio, so it looked very gothic. Excellent. And uh, Malcolm and I would go in there at night, and I say, Malcolm, I'm not even sure what we're doing is music. <laughs> okay, it was really pretty strange. It didn't matter though. Well, it didn't matter. I mean, I was having notes that were in between the notes. Right. I mean, my tone rows were not 12 notes; they were like 16 notes, where I had right. intervallic relationships that were stretched. Tonal, but, different uh, types of tonal arrangements. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, Herbie Mann was in the studio one night heard it. He was a very famous flautist and uh, yes. had a vanity label called Embryo Records that was distributed by Atlantic. And we put the, he said, you know, here's, here kid, here's 5,000 bucks, go ahead and make your record, I'll put it out. Wow. I said, Herbie, I'm not sure it's music. He said, I think it's music. And Malcolm says, he just needs a little editing. We'll put it together, we'll make it happen. Of course, Malcolm, genius yeah, yeah. player as well. Yeah. So we put the album out, and lo and behold, it got this incredible review in Rolling Stone. Wow. And Steve... That was 71, right? 71. Yeah. And Steve heard it, and the next thing we know, there's a knocking at this door on a Sunday yeah. at the studio. Malcolm lived on the third floor in the building next to the front door of the studio, and we looked out, and there was uh, Stevie in a pistachio green jumpsuit <laughs> with his... Uh, uh, with the guy who, who brought him by. Yeah, yeah. And Malcolm's friend, fellow bass player, Ronnie Blanco. And uh, it started then, and we didn't leave the studio for five years. Wow. And really what happened is we w really were the disruptors of the technology in bringing electronica to pop music. And, and now we're starting to see another major disruption, which I think we're going to talk about. In a yes, while. we're going to get to that here in a few minutes, uh, for sure. But. Uh, and now, as the synthesizer evolved and it was used in pop music more and more and more all the time, how did Devo find you? And you, how did you find Devo? How did that come about? Because you well, produced I was one of my favorite albums, Freedom of Choice, which includes, of course, their most known hit, Whip It. Right, and strangely enough, I have just cut a cover of the original Whip It, which is, I guess, 35 yeah. years old, yeah. or somewhere near there. Yeah. Right? I have just recut a new version with Lexi Baker of that's Whip It. It'll be fantastic. coming out in September. Has uh, um, Mark Mothersbaugh and uh, Bob Casale heard it yet? Or? Yes, Mark Mothersbaugh yeah. heard it and said he thought it was better than the original. Excellent. And he's volunteered to be in a cameo. Really? In the uh, video? In the video. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, but uh, I'm thrilled with it. Yeah. And uh, I think now we're starting to, uh, audio is beginning to emerge into a new place. It's been a very sort of... Uh, interesting uh, disillusion of the old system, the studio system, and yes. the records, and the film companies are also now sort of disincorporating these big, we might have big monolithic sort of distributors of audio, but right, right. you know, you don't need to go to digital domain to do digital editing anymore. You That's can right. do it on your laptop in your living room. You don't need to go to a recording studio to do, you know, a big recording studio with acoustic flooring and walls and stuff to do, uh, to do video, uh, audio or video, because now uh, our laptops have become our new folk instruments, That's in right. a sense. That's right. And uh, 
we have now able to compose and manipulate image and do everything, and it can now be a very intimate personal experience. There are no more interlocutors necessary. There are no more cameramen, per se, or That's right. recording engineer. In a, record, in a studio, in this kind of situation, of course, you have you know, camera, uh, cameramen and directors and so forth. But basically, when people are doing Vine or they're doing uh, Vimeos, they're making their own videos, like Lexi Baker, she's a graphic artist, she's a video maker, That's she right. makes her own videos, she writes her own songs, uh, she puts them all out, Yeah. right? She does everything. She's a very multi-talented person. I, I, the, so the, the I think song that, that we're going to be sampling at the end of the, of the, of the episode here, I think it's going to be a big dance hit. I mean, it's very catchy. It's it's, it's, it's just come out. It's called "Say It Like You Mean It," and, and it, we'll get to that. Right. And then, now, you also have this film company, and I, and um, when just like with with the synthesizer at the time when you got into that, you were making films. Did you come up with an idea that you, know, you think the next way of the next wave of disrupting is going to be with HPS 12.1 surround sound? Did you come to that conclusion by making, by working on uh, these episodes uh, about shipbuilding? Well, actually, my conclusion came from not about. I made, I had a company called Safe Harbor Pictures. Mm -hmm. It is uh, sort of in the rearview mirror at this point because I really am focusing on this new technology, mm -hmm. which I think is uh, as disruptive as the synthesizer. Yes, yes. And that technology is called headphone surround, HPS 12.1. It is actually like Dolby Atmos unfolding in your head. It does not need a room, yeah. but it unfolds inside your brain. It's a marvelous technology, and I hope if people have a minute to get, if they're listening now, to get your headphones out yeah. or your earbuds out and uh, put them on and start listening because later on in the show we'll actually play you some HPS headphone surround content, and I think you will find it very, very interesting. And yeah, definitely get your... Uh Get your headphones out or your little earphones, and, and, and we're going to participate in this together, okay? So get ready to do that. And this actually, is, it's is, a first. This is a first on broadcast television, so we have another first here on the Now Man Show. So get ready. It's very Just now. You know, we're going to do this. In the, it's very now. It's very now, man. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, and I know that you, uh, you put on the website, HPS 12.1 is a disruptive new production technology based on mathematical and cognitive models of audio perception. Now, for the, uh, the gearheads and the, uh, the geeks out there, exactly how would you distinguish HPS 12.1 from the stereo surround sound? Because when people go, most people know, right? from like going to the theaters, like you go you to a Star have, Wars movie right now, and you hear all these different things in the room. Right now, you cannot hear surround sound on earphones. Yes. Okay. Yes. But now, coming along, not only with music, but now with virtual reality. Yes. Okay. Yes. Where everything is now starting to happen on headphones. Uh, we need to be able to have that same spatial, that sense of spatial awareness that we have in the real world, inside, the, whether it's music or gaming, if you're moving inside the space, your head tracking has to That's right. do stuff. But also, you have to be able to listen to the background, to the music itself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, basically, I like to say it's like Dolby Atmos that unfolds in your head. Um, we've been able, through the technology, which you mentioned briefly, um, we're able to establish full directionality with a set of stereo headphones. Yes. We do not need to have a decoder for the music for music and content with with HPS because mm -hmm. it happens on the encode end where we render the music into a device where I can say I want the background vocals to be over here right, right. I want the lead vocal to be over here I want the guitar over here I want the conga players over there right so, so because basically spatial awareness is yes. a big part of music yes and frankly we had to ditch the whole concept of spatial awareness when we invented recording why? Because we couldn't store the information. Right. So what That's did we right. do? That's right. We invented echo and reverb to create the illusion of depth and space. That's right. Okay? Now, we can return and have that whole concept of depth and space inside a composition where somebody can be sitting in their living room with their computer and say, I wanna, I'm making a record here. I'm, my, I'm doing my editing and composing, and I, I'll be able to put the 
sounds where I want them. I mean, before recording, composers used the cold concept of antiphonal recording, of yeah, yeah, antiphonal yeah, yeah. performance um, uh, from time immemorial, whether yeah. it was in a, a Jewish temple 2,000 years yeah, ago yeah. or in a church 1,400 years ago. That's right. The choir was over here, the organ was that's over right, there. That's right. Wagner's operas often had uh, uh, music with players behind. Right, that's okay, right. In the balconies and so forth. They embraced the concept of surround as being a part of the church, the high church services. Yes. Used the concept of surround in the services to create the height of mysticism and to create that kind of emotional energy. Yes. We had to throw it all away when we invented recording because we simply could not store we couldn't, it. We couldn't do that. Yeah, and exactly. Every, we were able, it was amazing when we could actually create stereo sound and we could go from mono to stereo. People were blown away by that. That only took 60 years. That's right. Okay. That's right. You know, I was experimenting. The first record I ever produced, I ever mixed in surround, was Superstition with Stevie. Oh, was it really? And, so and there... we had a quad control room. We were fooling around in 1972 oh, right. with a system called QS. Uh, and it was a quad that was supposed to live in vinyl. Yes, then okay. you're right. Okay. Different and so concept. The rooms, the control rooms, where we worked with Steve, we built that control room. Studio B at the record plant, uh, Gary and Chris said, come to the record plant when you're, since you're in L.A., we'll build a studio exactly what you want. Wow. Well, we had already been in New York with Steve, and we had already been working at Electric Lady, built by John Stork, who I met at uh, Cerebrum when the thing was bleeping and blooping, right? And suddenly I found myself at Electric Lady in New York with Stevie and Tonto, and then the next move was to the record plant in Los Angeles. But, and it had to be done in the context of vinyl, though, which, like yeah, you were saying... Yeah, it had to be done it, in the con of course, which did not work. Right, okay? right. But the right. control rooms were set up in quad. Wow. And people say, why do your records sound so different to everybody yeah. else's records? That's right. what, is the, what is the difference? Well, the difference was, although we couldn't... I tried mixing Superstition in quad, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and incidentally, I've just remixed a 16-track Master of Superstition oh, did you really? into cool. HPS 12.1. Oh, I can't wait to hear it. It can be heard on my website. Oh, you can... We can yeah, oh, go, go to margolef.com and you can but hear you it. But you will have to... People who are really curious will have to get to, to reach me because that is a password-protected piece of material. Oh, yes, yes. But here I am 42 years later remixing the same song. That's great. The same thing is true with Whippet. I did a, the stereo and now I've done the HPS 12.1 version of it with Excellent. Lexi. Excellent. So is the wheel turning once again? Yes. yes. Is the new yes. disruptor coming when we can start to finally have the full That's right. co concept of surround audio yes. in headphones where you can be on a skateboard and listen to your music and have it in surround, That's where fantastic. you can bring that entire That's wonderful great. emotional energy, the situational awareness of music and effects inside and let it unfold in your head. Okay, let's, let's do the first thing. This is going to be a 30-second um, a um, little experiment here where you can actually hear sounds coming from Front left channel. Spectrum, okay? You have to put Front on your headphones. Right you have to put channel. on headphones or, or the earphones. Center headphones channel. Headphones left or earbuds, side channel, or. Whatever right you want. side okay. channel, you know, left this is rear a, channel, headphones on. right rear channel. Yeah, everybody ready? Upper front left channel. Are we ready to go in the Upper control Upper front room? right channel. Front left channel. Front right channel. Center channel. Left side channel. Right side channel. Left rear channel. Right rear channel. Upper front left channel. Upper front right channel, upper rear left channel, upper rear right channel, the voice of God. The voice of God is directly over your head. Yes, exactly. So we now have a full space. Wow. Okay. And uh, what we've brought into the studio uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, Lexi's first single, uh, which is mixed in both stereo and HPS. And strangely enough, HPS can live in vinyl. Wow, wow. So her album, uh, Ultimate Reality, which will have seven songs on it, uh, on one side the vinyl is in stereo, and on the other side the vinyl is in HPS. And, and this is, format's going to be available through all sorts of audio and video, like on iTunes and Amazon and Google. And Everywhere. And, and every... Tidal and Spotify and SoundCloud and... Bandcamp and Reverb Nation and all this stuff. Yes, all the aggregators. It, it because with uh, HPS, 
the audio is baked into the content. Whereas there are other gaming engines now, yes, and yes. also DTS offers Headphone X, and Dolby offers uh, Dolby uh, uh, Atmos Mobile. But those formats require a decoder in the playback side. Wow. wow. Okay, so you have to have, a, you know, in your preamp, you're going to have to switch to Dolby or DTS, and then you will get, but it has many more functions than just well, music. Um, as we, before we, we finish the show and we go and give you a sample of the new Lexi Baker single here that's already out, uh, go to, uh, on the website, where do we go to on the website? It's uh, margaleff.com. And to find this that we're looking at right now, it's uh, under say it like music, you mean it. Yeah, say it like you mean it. It's under Lexi Baker. Yeah, it's under it's under uh, music and video on the tab. Okay. And you'll see that it'll be a uh, you go to music and video and you'll see a little drop down menu come down. You'll say see it like say it like you mean it. And uh, if your headphones are on, I'm going to ask them to start playing it. And then they're going to flick the the. Uh, Player back and forth now once or twice. Flick. Now back. Eyes will be boys. That's the stereo. They and now. play with hearts like toys. They try to sell you now life. They yes. bargain right cause they're never on time. And girls the will be girls. We want their so heads to turn. We're getting that for the first time through this broadcast experience right here on the Now Man Show. And that this is a... This is awesome. Robert, tell us where you can hear, Incidentally, you can hear the songs in, in its entity. Right. It's available on iTunes and Apple Tunes now. You can buy the single in either stereo or in HPS 12.1. And it's also available, of course, on my website. And, and uh, it's, it's Lexi Baker. And when's the album officially going to be released? Well, the album will be coming uh, around Thanksgiving, but we're releasing singles now. Uh, there is Say It Like You Mean It, Model T. Have both been released, and coming uh, in the first week of June will be uh, um, uh, will be a song called "Everything." Everything. No, that's and so you're going to be releasing them singles one at a time. One at a time. We're going to do seven releases, uh, and then toward the end of that time, we'll be releasing uh, "Whip It" and, in oh, HPS excellent. and stereo. That, and then "Higher Ground" and uh, and, 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 and more. The rest and of the more. album will be yes. out uh, Thanksgiving yes. time. But, and uh, I'm trying to get people to really understand what it is and to come and use it because. It brings the music, the emotional content, back to music in terms of being able to create things that are totally free, existent in space and electronica, but uh, we can create our own world in our own space. And I think that that's what really makes it wonderful. Thank you so much, Robert. And be sure to look for the PBS special coming up, which is Sound Barriers. Also, Sound this Breakers. is Nice Wonder and Sound Breakers. And you are watching The Now Man Show with Robert Margaleff. Thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank you. And watch your show now, man. That's right. <laughs>